Cool. Um, so yeah, my name is Nicolas Almonte. Uh, today I'm going to try to um, kind of show you everything that's related to WebGL uh, for graphics and data visualization. So first question is, who here is familiar with WebGL? Nice. Awesome. OK. So we're going to go um, through like a bunch of like use cases, interesting use cases for WebGL in, in specifically like data visualization. Then we're going to go through um, a bit of like explaining how the uh, WebGL works behind the scenes, so uh, rendering pipeline and stuff like that. And then we'll go through an actual example. Um, and we'll have a, a bit of a look into the code. Um, so yeah, before that, uh, I used to work at Twitter. Uh, I worked there for three years, uh, leading the, uh, the public facing data visualization work. I recently moved over to Uber, where I'm leading a new data visualization team. And uh, we're hiring, so if you're interested, please uh, come find me. So yeah, this is the agenda. Um, hopefully, you won't get lost around the third to fourth point. Um, but let's start with WebGL. What is WebGL? Um, so WebGL is, is just like a JavaScript API to, app, to access the GPU. Um, and the GPU is, is pretty fast. So this is one example I built uh, when I was at Twitter showing a number of retweets for the Obama tweet, the four more years tweet. So this is just like showing 800,000 uh, retweets and which you know, reached like millions of, of uh, viewers on Twitter. Um, and this sort of thing you can build with, with WebGL pretty easily actually. So in terms of the standard, this was developed by the Kronos Group. Um, Kronos Group is the same organization that actually built the um, OpenGL, wrote the OpenGL standard in the early 90s for these sort of like desktop, really old computers. Um, and then uh, it moved over to the OpenGL ES standard, the embedded system standard. The 1.0 version was out in the early 2000s. Uh, this is why I'm using that fat like iPhone. Um, and then it evolved over to WebGL. Uh, WebGL 1.0 is the actual same API than OpenGL ES 2.0 and WebGL 2.0, which will be out probably this year, uh, mimics the OpenGL ES 3.0 API. Uh, the biggest change be between OpenGL and OpenGL ES uh, at some point was the fact of adding a programmable pipeline. And I'm going to go through that afterwards. Uh, but it basically lets you code some actual uh, GLSL code, which is a specific domain-specific language for graphics, to do uh, some neat stuff on the GPU. So what can WebGL be used for? So I have a bunch of examples. Not all of them are data visualization related, but um, hopefully uh, we'll cover everything. So maybe you are already familiar with you know, 2D Canvas or SVG and D3, and you're like, OK, why would I be using WebGL for like um, you know, I, I don't usually, made, maybe I don't usually visualize like 100,000 elements and maybe it doesn't even make sense. We should aggregate those. Uh, but, you know, here I'll show a bunch of examples that probably are within your domain of work and, and you know, hopefully you'll get inspired and want to learn WebGL. So we're going to go through exploratory visualizations. Um, you have a lot of data, how to kind of like filter and manipulate that data uh, in a way that the rendering uh, is not the bottleneck of the processing. Uh, we're going to go through real-time data analysis, another, another example in which um, you know, using other web standards uh, is definitely slower than using WebGL. We're going to go through a bit of storytelling, scientific visualization, and then data art uh, or data illustration. So this first example, let's see if it loads. Yeah. So this example shows uh, loads uh, all the cities that have an airport. Uh, I think, or all the main cities I have in airport. And then it loads all the different airlines, and you can uh, basically browse through each one of the airlines and see um, all the different routes. So th uh, this data is actually a bunch of, of years old already. But the interesting thing is that you know, here you can kind of explore the centroid of the different routes, and so you can infer where the airline is coming from, like Air France, centroid is France, uh, US Airways, uh, the US. And uh, TAM, for example, is in South America. Um, Qantas, for example, might be interesting in Australia. And as you can see, we can still you know, add routes. And you know, we're definitely adding hundreds to thousands of routes. Um, and the rendering is like not complaining at all. So it's working pretty well. Um, you can also interact with the 3D shape. 
it's pretty smooth. So in terms of like you know interaction or like being able to kind of like load a lot of data, these are like primitives, are you know lines and circles and so on. Um, it's uh, WebGL. The rendering is not the the bottleneck of the application. It's mostly all that is related to computations in JavaScript, uh, but not the actual rendering. At least for these sort of examples. Um, on the exploratory visualization side, we have other types of examples, um, maybe less flashy, or but more like useful in a sense. So I, I built, for example, this example on um, trying to visualize the mobility flow in France. So we've be, we've seen a bunch of maps that uh, sort of like visualize mobility flow, like people flowing from one state to the other of the U.S. And we've seen remixes of these maps. Um, and you know, in most cases, like these maps use arrows. Um, and this is a visualization question, actually. I, I don't really know why they would use arrows if you can actually color code everything. The arrows actually are including uh, you know, other states and so on. So what I decided is, okay, I'm gonna build my own mobility map and I wanna see what's the mob mobility like in France. So mobility means you know, that within the five years, one person moved from one state in France to another. Uh, and here I'm color coding, so uh, each state. So this means that each state, if it's more red, means that more people are getting into that state. If it's blue, means that more people are actually exiting that state. And so what you can do is, you can hover here, for example, say Paris, and ask yourself, well, where do people go from, from Paris? And so you'll see that the suburbs are the first places people go to. Actually, nobody goes to Paris from this chart, but everybody goes as elsewhere. So this, this might tell you something about mobility flow in Paris. If you um, kind of hover the suburbs, then you'll see that people go even further out and so on. And so you can, you can keep hovering these other states and you'll see um, the mobility patterns. But you know, WebGL is not you know, the definitive tool to visualize these sort of things. I, I went even further and I tried to zoom in and be able to visualize each one of the counties. So counties is definitely like 40,000 or so on. County, so that this starts being like kind of like a pretty big data set, um, and so this is the case where I feel that you know WebGL is definitely uh, maybe one step ahead in the sense that you can you know you can use it to kind of like browse through all these all these big data set um, and and you won't see any lag. A similar example of like exploring a data set um, is this one. In this one, I'm uh, visualizing wind patterns. So uh, for each one of the, uh, of the stations recording this sort of like wind speed, direction, and temperature, uh, I took the, all the data for the last 72 hours. And I actually packed that into a binary array buffer, which is a binary data structure instead of just having a text as a JSON because it's pretty big. And I loaded that. Um, and I built this sort of like tool in which you can, you can explore across this, the last 72 hours how, how weather evolved. And it's interesting that suddenly you kind of like see this, this outlier here, right? And you can, you can replay this uh, on every hour uh, and see how kind of like Mount Washington gets every time like bigger and bigger. Um, so in this case, it's, it's kind of like the same situation. You have a lot of data. You're still aggregating the data. Wow, that's going to explode. Um, uh, but, you know, it's interesting for you to just like dump the data in and, and be able to explore it be, without any lag. You can change the visual marks over to circles or lines if you just want to focus on the direction of the wind. Um, another example I really like, um, which is also a pretty straightforward to build with WebGL, is uh, Surface Explorer. So this is more for like people who like math, but I, I feel it's, it's still interesting. You can load any, any parametric equation here, and you can display it, for example, as a grid or just as a surface. And you can change the time parameter. Let's say we're going to use two, and then make it loop. Um, let's say five. Uh, and then we can change this. You can actually change the equation, um, and it gets recompiled. Uh, let's see, times five. Yeah, it makes kind of weird things. So. You know, this is as a as a kind of like interactive way to just like see what happens with different equations, and you know, instead of in, instead of like trying to imagine what all these like long line of you know sinus and cosinus things mean, you can just like directly visualize it and, and edit yourself these sort of equations. Uh, another one I used uh, 
I used WebGL for was this temperature anomalies visualization that is uh, taking a lot to load, a lot of time to load, actually. Yep. Um, so this one took, uh, takes NASA imagery uh, of different uh, changes in temperature across the years from 1880 to 2004. And so what blue color coding means is that the temperature went down from, you know, from that period, from the 80, 80, 1880s to 1884. Uh, temperature in those regions went down, and red means the temperature went up. And so this kind of like makes a good case for maybe um, climate change uh, people. So this means you know, between 1890s and, and, and 1894, temperature was going down. But if you go over to 1990s, you see that it starts going up pretty rapidly and over 2000s, uh, the Earth is on fire. So that's in for exploratory database. So you've, we've seen a bunch of examples. Most of them are using geodata, uh, but you could definitely like, you know, uh, consider using you know, um, exploratory data visualizations of like could be anything, a scatter plot, and so on. So actually, now we're going to look at real-time data analysis, and the data structure that we're going to be using is uh, something that takes abstract data, and and not like you know scientific data like position and lat longs. So this one uh, is mostly to showcase um, kind of like the the real-time uh, analytics that one can build on this. Uh, this does this have sound? You have sound, please. Yes. No. Maybe. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's plugged in. It's a video. It's playing some really good music. I'm really <laughs> sad that. Uh, okay, no problem. Um, so uh, what this is doing is actually taking every frame of this video that is looping as a vine, and uh, it's decomposing the image into different colors. So it's creating basically a color histogram of each one of the pixels. So if you have you know an image that's fully red, then you'll have this color cube that shows it uh, a lot of red on the bottom right there. The RGB cube is a cube in which each one of the components in the 3D space is a different color, right? And you can change this sort of uh, representation, right? So if you use HSL or HSV, you're changing the cube, the RGB cube, into a different shape. So uh, here you can change the video and see the different decompositions for uh, for different images, actually, I used this Shrek tra trailer to kind of test it out from the beginning. Um, and you can change the, the color scheme. So if you change to the bicone, for example, you can see how color decomposition happens in that specific uh, color scheme. And if you change it over to the, to the one cone, you can see that too. So this is the sort of thing that would be really uh, taxing or expensive to do into the cameras because of the rendering bottleneck that you have of like trying to visualize all, the, all these dots at the same time. Uh, and we're not just rendering dots, we're rendering actually 3D structures uh, in it. Other things like, you know, some of the vines actually make up like some interesting sculptures, like this one, for example. It has a bunch of like nested uh, white dots. We used like a transparent shape so that we don't include the other the other three D shapes. So this is for real time data analysis. You could imagine like try to do analysis on top of sound, on top of like other types of images, do image processing and stuff like that, and all that would happen in real time, and you would not see any any lags if you kind of code it well. Um, Another option is storytelling, and I actually built this uh, when I was at Twitter. Uh, this went out on Can Lion uh, Can. Um, so this is the mentions of Ian McKellen and Sir Patrick Stewart doing time on tweets, um, and the yellow dots show actually mentions of the of the two people in the same tweet. So this this visualization is trying to show that you know there's a growth of interactions between Sir Patrick Stewart and and Ian McKellen through time. Uh, those can be related to a specific. Uh, timing which like they actually traveled together to New York and went to this play together and other things can be related actually to you know a bigger friendship they have or also can be related to the fact that they're actually promoting their last X-Men movie. Uh, this is not particularly super insightful but it's definitely a nice uh, 
a nice way to tell a story. Uh, it, this was used by the XX at Twitter during Cannes, and this was shown to Sir Patrick Stewart. He was on stage, and he was like, wow, this is amazing. So it's, it's definitely like a good way to, to do some, something that's eye-catching and keeps the attention over to the, to the screen. Um, another thing that's actually very useful, uh, but I don't use that much, is uh, scientific visualization. So a lot of people use uh, some pretty interesting algorithms, for example, to visualize flow. And you've probably seen the wind map or, or earth. And, um, and these, these kind of like techniques of showing you know, the flow of vector fields are called line integral convolutions. And uh, the way you'd implement this is uh, if you, you want to use the GPU, it also doesn't have any lag if you, if you implement it that way. Um, and so this very same technique can be used to do fluid simulations and, and, and things like that in which you interact with the screen and then you simulate the, the actual flow based on something called texture advection, which is uh, moving a little bit the texture that, that's behind it. This is an image behind the cursor and we're just like moving a little bit the points of that texture. And that's why it's called texture advection. So you could use it for things that are actually more useful. For example, have this like magnetic dipole and you can kind of like explore how you know, different charges interact with each other and how, how an actual electric field looks like because you cannot see an electric field unless you throw sand and then you'll see the actual lines and this is what this is showing. And finally, there is data art. So we built this uh, for the screens uh, in the Twitter office. The main idea was to have some sort of a, uh, a nice you know, visual that would show us uh, different vines based on the number of, of revines or views each vine had, or loops actually, each vine had, and then try to explore what were the best vines uh, along there. And so we did this uh, for Hack Week. This is a WebGL implementation. Uh, I implemented this sort of uh, algorithm that it's a space filling algorithm that shows, um, it's a fractal space filling algorithm. Uh, so it covers a space with these sort of like shapes and you could use different primitives like, uh, you know, rectangles and, and circles and, and, and hexagon and so on. And you can be sure that it will al always fill in the space without any overlap. Um, and then what we do, we just like explore each one of these videos and, um, and we keep them looping and then we dissolve the actual uh, kind of like structure and load a new structure afterwards. And actually, we did this for Hack Week, um, and we didn't win, but we got an email from Dick saying like, hey, this is a great project. You should totally uh, you know, implement this in the screen. So we already have, well, I, I don't work at Twitter anymore, but um, uh, we had the space for that. And some of the things, so this is actual like interactive thing. So you could you know, zoom, zoom out, and you can see all these, all these different objects playing the video. This is something that definitely cannot be done with any other web standard other than WebGL. Cool. Um, so hopefully you've seen in, in any of all of these examples something that you might be interested in or you might be you know, uh, knowing to know how it works. Um, so we'll, we'll just dive into like WebGL. This is kind of like the more dense part. But if you get this, you probably get like 80% of how WebGL works. Um, so WebGL, JavaScript API, right? So main thing, uh, let's say you have an array of floats, an array of points, X, Y, Z coordinates. You want to send that over to the GPU to be rendered in a kind of like a 3D scene. So this JavaScript API does this. It, it allows you to store an array of floats into a buffer, which is a spacing memory, that then can be accessed by the GPU and be rendered. Um, so that's kind of like the simplified version. A bit more complicated is that the fact that we have a programmable pipeline lets us uh, be able to write some GLSL code to write a vertex shader and a fragment shader. So what are a vector shader and fragment shader? A vertex shader is, imagine this as a callback. In, in a callback in which you receive this array of floats one by one, and then you need to return one float one by one. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. The vertex shader is usually, usually used to transform points, to rotate points, scale an object, and so on. Whereas the fragment shader, you can imagine this as another callback that it gets called for each pixel in the, in the screen. And it decides which color the pixel in the screen is going to be. 
Of course, this would be super costly if it wasn't done in parallel. And this is why you can, you can use a GPU to do this. So besides writing the, your JavaScript API to send over the array of floats, you need to write a file that does the one-to-one -one mapping between those points to some other points that are transformed, scaled, or rotated. And then you need to write another callback that will get for each pixel will decide which color the pixel will be, right? Cool, so how does the pipeline work? Um, and so this is behind the scenes. Some things are programmable, some are not. So the vertex shader, we already covered that up. You write this, this is programmable. You decide where these four points, you just, uh, eight points you just send over are gonna be. Triangle assembly face. Most of the time you don't want just to render points, you want to render faces. And so this part is not, not programmable, but the computer will figure out how to build faces out of the points. And so you have a few options on how to pick up the vertices to make faces. For example, imagine that you have four vertices that make up a square. Now this square is made up of three triangles, right? Because the, the minimal face in a, in a 3D thing is a triangle. So how, how would you pick the points to build the triangles? Each triangle will have three points, so you will need six points but you're sending over four. So you need to send over like indices on like how these triangles are gonna get drawn. Uh, the other uh, step is the rasterization phase. You have all these like 3D concept, right? But this gets projected into the screen. So this is what the rasterization phase does. It converts whatever 3D notion you were handling into pixels. And finally, you have the fragment shader phase. That callback that gets called for each one of those pixels and you get to decide which color the faces are gonna be of your, of your cube, for example. Hopefully, you're still with me. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the GLSL, right? So you're gonna have to write this fragment shader code and this vertex shader code. What does GLSL looks like? So it's called GLSL because it's GL shading language. It's a DSL for graphics, a domain specific language for graphics. It actually looks pretty familiar, it looks like C. So if you've ever looked at C, it kinda looks like GLSL. Uh, the other good features it has is the fact that it has built-in types for graphics, right? So it has built-in types for vectors and matrices and so on. It has a lot of built-in functions, uh, not only math functions, but functions for graphics you need like reflect and refract. And finally, the feature I love the most, and I love JavaScript to have this, but it doesn't, is operator overloading. You can do operations between different types and you know it will figure it out and it will work as you would expect. So you can add two vectors and use a plus sign or add two matrices and use the same plus sign and we'll figure that out. This is how a bit of code in GLSL looks like. This code actually doesn't do anything, it's just like a demonstration. So in the first line, we're building a vector out of this uh, constructor. So you can use vec4 as a constructor, you pass in two arguments and you can compose constructors. So you can pass in the other two values as a vec2, for example. Then what you can do is you can refer to vector.xyz to get a copy of a three component vector and you assign that over to a point. Now here you could use any sort of like uh, sub indexing. So you could do vector.yyy and that will return you a vec3 with the three components being the y component and vector4. Or you could you know, write like vector zyx or wzyx and so on and that will return a new vector. Now you can refer to vectors indices like XYZ or you can refer them to RGB, XYZW or RGBA. Why is this? Because the vertex shader changed the position of the points but the fragment shader changed the color of the pixels in theory. So it's nice to be able to refer to the same components in two ways. Um, finally, we're creating a matrix and then we're multiplying a vector by a matrix and we'll get the desired value. Now the second block of code uh, it's interesting as well because it shows the operator of loading thing, right? So we define two vectors, uh, one vector that is a, a, an empty vector and the other one is a vector one and we want to interpolate between, between these values. Let's say we're kind of like animating something and so the delta value will go from zero to one and we, we want to kind of like find the, the mid-range value in between those two. And so we can use plus signs and minus signs and multiplication signs and, and all this will work just fine because of operator overloading. The plus sign is defined for vec4, is defined for mat4, for vec3, and so on. So we can always use the same signs for everything. Otherwise, if we were in Java or in JavaScript, we would have to do vector.add.sub.mult.mat4, and so on, which is horrible. 
as far as the built-in functions go, there's a lot of like math functions, so that is all covered. And then there's a bunch of like graphic pre, uh, specific functions like refract and reflect that you can use. Okay, let's go over through an example. Uh, this is gonna be even more complicated, <laughs> but it will be fun. So this example, it's called the Hopf vibration. Uh, it's this sort of like mathematical thing that I ran out into like uh, a few weeks ago and I really liked it and I wanted to implement this. So Hopf vibration is a way to kind of explore four dimensional shapes. So how do you explore four dimensional shapes? Well, you try to project them into 3D and try to see the different shapes, just like you do in a, in a globe versus a map, right? You have all these different map projections because you want to explore all the different properties of this globe. Uh, so this guy, Hopf, uh, let's, let's try to, to uh, kind of understand what he did. So first step will be trying to understand what he did. Second step will be trying to understand how to implement this in an example. So Hopf map is a function, a one-to-many function. It maps one point in the sphere, in a three-dimensional sphere, over to a circle in a four-dimensional sphere. What this means is, um, what does it, this mean? Um, <laughs> it's a nice way to explore a four-dimensional shape because you can, you can imagine a sphere, you can imagine a point in a sphere, and this will generate something different in a four-dimensional shape. Now, the problem is, I'm showing you a circle in a three-dimensional space, not in the four-dimensional space, right? So that is kind of like a trick. So I need a second step, a step to project the circle from four-dimensional space to three-dimensional space, and we do a projection, a map projection. So now question for you, what map projection will preserve circles from a higher order sphere over to a plane, for example? The stereographic projection. Of course, you all knew this, <laughs> right? So if you have a circle in the sphere and you project that over to a 2D plane, using the stereographic projection, you'll get a circle in the 2D plane. Why is this important? Because if we have this four-dimensional circle and we use a, a stereographic projection on the four-dimensional circle, we'll get a three-dimensional circle, right? And so it's nice because it means that it kind of like keeps the shape. It doesn't kind of like stretch or do anything weird with the shape. Uh, whereas like if you use this on, on planet Earth, you see this kind of like really distorted map, which is not nice to see, though it preserves the circles in the equator and all the other uh, kind of circles you, you might have. So let's see a demo now that we all understand what this does. <laughs> so now we have a point in a sphere. Do you see it on the bottom left? That maps over to a circle, right? I'm gonna replay this. So point in sphere, orbiting around the sphere, right? Maps to a different circle. Let's try to explore this shape. If we add a bunch of points in the, in the equator, we'll see this new shape unfold, which is some sort of torus. This interesting torus can be uh, flipped actually upside down. So if we rotate these points, we'll kind of like rotate upside down the torus. Interesting shape, right? Now let's try to explore it more and we'll add a bunch more points to the sphere, going up and down the sphere and see how this kind of like four dimensional shape behaves. So it's kind of like, you know, some sort of like nested toruses that can be upside down. Easy. <laughs> Finally, we open this up a little bit and um, we'll see that we can actually interact with the shape and kind of like explore this a little bit more on our side. I'll go through this in a sec. Cool. A very useful thing to do, right? Very practical. Um, Let's cover how the hop map work. Like, forget about the example, let's think about the code. So I need to write these two functions in GLSL. One function will map one point in a, in a sphere over to a circle that has four coordinates. So that's the first function, the hop function. The bottom one is a serographic projection. This one will take one point in uh, 4D space and project it into 3D space. So if we kind of combine these two functions together, we'll get one point in the sphere and a three-dimensional circle, right? We have one point in a sphere and a four-dimensional circle, 
And then we have another function that maps a four-dimensional circle into a three-dimensional circle. So this is what we're seeing right now, one point in a sphere and a three-dimensional circle. So let's think about the, the top function. Um, so let's think about the signature of the function. So the function will return a four-dimensional point, but we'll get a latitude and a longitude in the sphere, right? Those two last arguments there on the top right. So given a latitude and a longitude, we'll get a four-dimensional point. But we should get a set of four-dimensional points, the points that make up the circle, the four-dimensional circle. So for this, we kind of have this extra parameter called eta, which will go from 0 to 2 pi, that will give us kind of like sample points of these points in the circle, right? So if we get, let's say, eta will go 0, 0 0.5, and 2 pi, then we'll get three points that are part of this four-dimensional circle. And then the second function, you don't really need to think much about it, is just like it takes a, a four-dimensional vector and returns a three-dimensional vector. So we will take a four-dimensional point and show you that point in the, in the screen in three-dimensional space. Cool, let's think about the data model. We have this function in the vertex shader, right? It's a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So on the data model, ideally, in JavaScript, we would have this array that has a bunch of lat longs, right? And these lat longs will get converted into a set of points, in a set of circles. Now the problem is, as I said before, the vertex shader will only have a one-to-one -one mapping. So if you, send uh, if you send one lat long to the vertex shader, you will get one point. But we want a set of points. We want the points that make up the circle. So in order to do this, we need to send over extra data. We need to send a lat, a long, and a third argument which is kind of like the parameterized circle shape. Now this is a lot of data, like and a lot of like repeating values and so on. So hopefully we have this thing called instanced arrays, which is an extension to WebGL that let us load the, the different data separately. And in this case, it will make the kind of the cross of the 0 to 2 pi column and the column of lat long in kind of the GPU. So the first line, what it does is it takes the hop program, the one that refers to vertex shader that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, and it sets a buffer, which is an array of floats from 0 to 2 pi, which is the granularity or the sample points we want to have for this circle. The second line uh, sets just the lat long points, but it's calling this property called instanced, which means, okay, we're going to have to do the cross product between the 0 to 2 pi over to these lat long points. But ideally, kind of like if you need to, to remember something out of this, is that in JavaScript you're setting the buffers with the proper points you want to visualize. And in the vertex shader, you'll do the conversion over to the actual screen points you want to see. So good. This is kind of like how it looks like for the first time. It looks like a bunch of points, right? Because this is what we got back. We sent over a bunch of points. We got over a bunch of points transformed into a circle. If we use GL line loop or GL lines, we'll see a bunch of lines. But if you think about the example again, well, it looks a bit better, right? We have a bunch of tubes, and we have a bunch of lighting, and so on. So we're not actually rendering lines. We're rendering tubes. So we need, we need to find a way of rendered tubes instead of rendering points or lines. So let's think about this. We're sending an array from 0 to 2 pi. That array gets converted into a circle. If we just sent a canonical tube from 0 to 2 pi, we could topologically uh, make it a tube, right? That, that kind of makes up a circle, right? So instead of sending an array that has from 0 to 2 pi and having back a circle, we'll just send over points that make up 3D tube and then we'll, we'll deform or, or stretch the tube to be this sort of circle in 3D. I won't go over the code of this, but it's doable. Third thing, we have the interactions. And this is really interesting because it's, it's kind of like the main pain point on the WebGL applications you might have is like, okay, we have all this thing rendering really well, but I can't really interact with it. Or I can just like move the camera, but I cannot actually click on anything. And so here we provide a bunch of interactions. Actually, if you hover the sphere here, you can kind of explore the, the shape. And so you can you know, move around and see how 
that actual point in the sphere would map with, with the actual circle. You can click here and kind of like store those if we clear the points. Like you can see how it, wow, this place here makes a weird shape, right? So, you know, we discovered this new spot. So in order to interact with it, what we need to do is we are hovering a sphere, right? But we don't know anything about the 3D shape of the sphere. Canvas is, WebGL is just like 2D canvas in the fact that it's rendering over to a bunch of pixels in the screen. It's like hovering an image. Like you might get the pixel and the color of the pixel, but you don't get the actual shape or the object. So how this works is we render uh, into an offline image, an image you won't see. Imagine you render something over on a canvas, but you don't append the canvas to the DOM. So this is how it works. We render over a sphere that has this really special texture. This texture is one different color per pixel. So when you hover the sphere, and we get the pixel from that sphere that you're hovering, that color will be unique and will map, map uniquely to a position in the sphere. It's easy to map from a color to, to a position, right? Because RGB goes from zero to one, it has three coordinates. In this case, we have a sphere that only has two coordinates, latitude and longitude, so we could only use the red and green channels to encode this. In this case, we're using the red and blue channels. And so when you hover the sphere, you get the pixel out, you get the color of that pixel, and then you can map that color over back to a lat long range. And then you send over that point. And this is what's happening uh, in the example. And this is called color picking. So usually what you do in WebGL is that if you have, let's say, three, three spheres and you want to be able to hover these spheres and know which sphere you're hovering, you render offline in a frame buffer each one of the spheres in a different color. And then when you hover the sphere, you get back the pixel and you know which, which pixel maps to each sphere, right? Cool. Key takeaways. You've seen a bunch of code. You've seen a bunch of use cases. Uh, good things about WebGL and bad things about WebGL. Good things is that it uses a GPU. This means that you can render hundreds of thousands or millions of objects like, and not have any, any bottleneck <coughs> issues. Uh, you can render 3D stuff if you want to. You can render 2D stuff as well, uh, as we've seen with the data art examples. Uh, you can do a lot of things with WebGL, not only 3D games, you can use it for, for visualization. It can be scientific visualization. It can be exploratory database. Uh, you can do data art as well. But uh, related to this and the example, as you can see, the API is pretty much low level. So I would definitely recommend you, if you're starting, uh, to use uh, 3.js or there are other libraries like StackGL, for example, uh, that use NPM modules to kind of like build your, your own uh, WebGL framework. I build a library called PhiloGL which is, uh, it's a pretty simple library. It's, it's nice to start with if you want to kind of like grasp the concepts of WebGL. But yeah, definitely use a library. And with this, thank you.